Happy Black History Month and welcome to Reading Hour. My name is Mary Gordon and I'm a development coordinator for the Willie and Elizabeth Gordon Family Foundation. The Willie and Elizabeth Gordon Family Foundation honors the legacy of our ancestors by giving back to disenfranchised communities through education, excellence, empowerment, and service. And we offer scholarships, virtual events, and local backpack and school supply drives. Just a reminder, this event is being recorded, so please feel free to post questions and comments on Facebook, and remember to be kind. Let's start with the first question for all of our listeners. How do you celebrate Black History Month? How do you celebrate Black history all year round? And why is it important to you? Last June, we hosted a panel that celebrated Juneteenth. And this was the first year that Juneteenth was celebrated as a national holiday in our country. So let's look at a video from this event. Hi, my name is Grant Gilliam and I will be going through the significance of June 19th, 1865, and what it really truly means for our country. Juneteenth, Freedom Day, the true Emancipation Day, Black Independence Day. This day culminates the technical end of slavery in the United States. Now I do say technical, because the official day that slavery was decreed to end in the United States was when Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. So, at the end of the Civil War, in April 9th, 1865, slavery in the United States was supposed to come to a halt, but it didn't, not for another two months. That's how long it took Union soldiers to go to many parts of Texas to make that happen. It was in Galveston, Texas, that the last set of slaves in that region would be liberated. That day was June 19th, 1865. After their disbelief in the news, the former slaves immediately began to celebrate with prayer, feasting, song, and dance. A year later, the first celebration of this event took place in Texas. And over the next few years, the tradition spread to many parts of the nation. So if we're being very honest with ourselves, we have to admit that this anniversary has been suppressed for many of us for a very long time. After Reconstruction and the introduction of Jim Crow laws that plagued the South, along with other systematic racial restrictions that had taken place all throughout our land. The true essence of freedom for many African Americans was tempered for decades to come. Coupled back with the fact that little to none of our contributions as African Americans in this country were highlighted or told within the fabric of U.S. history. To many people, Juneteenth was just another casualty of events that were suppressed by those in power. For some African Americans, the knowledge of Juneteenth had lived on and was preserved down from generation to generation. But for many others, that sadly had not been the case. From my personal experience, Juneteenth was not an event that was talked about within my household, not my extended family, and it certainly was not brought up in my schooling in the South. During the period of discussing the Civil War, no mention was had. During the months of Black History Month, where our history was already watered down and incomplete, there was no mention of June 19th. 
Dare I say that this event was also excluded when I took an African American's history course in college. Despite the widespread educational depravity of our history, our history still perseveres. The progression of truth continues to grow and spread throughout time and regions from those who possess that knowledge. Over the past few decades, we have all been re-educating ourselves with many stories of African-American truths, events, tragedies, and accomplishments. We have been pushing the narrative to include our history within the history books of America because it is American history. To only tell one side of the story does not tell the whole truth. And without telling the whole truth, we run into danger of telling and learning lies. So with the reemergence of Juneteenth and of that emotional historical relevance that it serves for us, let us also continue to promote and educate ourselves to the rest of our rich history. And remember that that too is American history. Thank you. All right, what an awesome video and what an awesome lesson about how to celebrate Black history all year round. So everyone, it's time to get to our first book. The dining room table is a special place. My grandmother's table was covered with freshly baked cakes, especially her famous pound cake. My brother and I hid under our dining room table and my aunts and uncle welcome family and friends to holiday celebrations all year round. What do you remember about your table? Mathia Sales will be reading Our Table by Peter H. Reynolds. Our Table by Peter H. Reynolds. Violet fondly remembered the table. She remembered gathering food, preparing the table, cooking meals, lighting candles, so many stories, laughter, celebrating, sharing, making memories together. Recently, though, Violet found herself alone at the table. Her family had become busy, very busy. They had new places to be. Violet found her father in his favorite chair, in front of a big screen, bigger than Violet. She found her mother on the staircase, chatting silently on her phone. Violet found her brother in his room, playing games with friends she could not see. Feeling quite alone, Violet dreamed of a time when family and friends would gather at the table. Walking by the room where their quiet table stood, Violet did a double take. She noticed something had changed. Their table was smaller. The next day, it had become even smaller. By the end of the week, the table had shrunk so much that it easily fit into the palm of her hand. Violet blinked. The table vanished. Violet knew exactly what she had to do. She asked her father to watch a show about carpentry together, and they did. Violet asked her mother to write a message and post it to see who knew how to build a table, and they did. She asked her brother to use his computer to help draw out a plan together, and they did. Violet was ready. She asked her family to build a table together, and they did. When they were done, Violet paused to marvel at their creation a place to come together to share stories once again, a table to make memories, a table stronger, more beautiful than ever, and it was. Thank you, Mathia, for reading. For those of you who are watching in the comments, please feel free to type your favorite memories in the chat. I see that someone definitely remembers some pound cake and I've got a second on that pound cake as well. All right, so now it's time to read William and the Good Old Days by Eloise Greenfield and illustrated by Jan Spilvey Gilchrist. What I love about this book is the relationship between William and his grandmother and cousin William is going to read it for us. Uh, cousin Will here. Um, with me today, I will actually be helping with reading time. And today we have William 
and The Good Old Days by Eloise Greenfield and illustrated by Jan Spebby Gilchrist. So that'll be exciting. Um, okay. So let's start with the beginning. William and the Good Old Days. Here I go again, thinking about that fly and getting mad. Yeah, I'm mad. That's because I still think it was that big, ugly fly that made my grandma sick. Mommy and Daddy said it wasn't. I remember what happened that day. I was sitting on this tall stool in Grandma's restaurant, eating my good dinner. Granddaddy and Mr. Frank were sitting on the other stools. And Miss Betty and Miss Lucille were sitting in the big chairs. And Grandma was standing at the stove, stirring the bean soup. Everybody was laughing and having a good time. You got William mad, you got that big old fly, you got that nice cool looking restaurant. Then, all of a sudden, I saw this fly zooming around, zooming around, trying to get in everybody's food. I said, Grandma, there's a fly in here. Grandma said, oh no. Then she slammed the lid on the pot of soup and she grabbed the box of shiny paper off the shelf and covered up the hot rolls. She said, William, bring me that swat. I got the swatter and grandma knocked the fly on the floor and she hit him about a hundred times and that was the end of that fly. See her? She got the swatter right here. She about to knock the heavens out of that fly. But right after that, about a week or a day after that fly upset my grandma, she got real sick and had to go to the hospital. She stayed a long time. And even though she's back at her house now, she's still sick. Her eyes can't see anymore, but I don't like to think I like to think about grandma the way she used to be back in the good old days. Last year when I was little. See? There's grandma. It's a hospital in there, so kind of the not so good old days. When I close my eyes, I can see that grandma. I can see her hugging people, big people and children too, making them happy. And everybody calling her mama, even if she wasn't there. If somebody who didn't know her came in the restaurant and didn't treat her nice, her friends looking at them funny and saying, I know you're not talking to mama like that. So here you go, grandma, and all her loved ones. Here I am thinking about it. That's why grandma named her restaurant Mama's Kitchen. And every day, the same people used to come there to eat their dinner. Sometimes they would help grandma work. They'd say, Mama, let me wash those collard greens. Or they'd clean the crumbs off the counter. And Miss Betty washed the dishes every day just because she wanted to. See? Another good look at the restaurant. Another good look at William. Mommy used to take me to the restaurant all the time, back in the good old days. And that was my favorite place to be. As soon as I got there, Grandma would say, Well, here's my boy. You want some juice, William? I'd say, Uh huh. I'm real thirsty, Grandma. Grandma would take me to the refrigerator and I'd pick out any kind of juice I wanted. And after I drank it, I'd wash my hands and go help Grandma fold the napkins. When we finished, I'd lean over a little bit and hold my stomach. Grandma, I'd say, I'm real hungry after all that work. So Grandma would fix me a big plate of food, a piece of turkey wing and dressing and sweet potatoes and greens from her garden and yellow cornbread with just enough butter. It was so good. Every Saturday, Grandma used to cook chicken in the barbecue grill out front of her restaurant. A whole lot of people would come and stand around and watch and talk to each other and talk to me and make me laugh. I'd walk around and visit everybody. And when I got to Mr. Dennis, he always acted like he didn't even see me. So I'd tap him on his hand. So here goes Grandma cooking outside. There I go talking to Mr. Dennis. He'd frown and look up at the sky and say, uh-oh, I think I feel it's rough rain. I'd tap him again and say, that doesn't feel like rain, Mr. Dennis. He'd say, William, thank goodness it's you. Thought all of our good chicken was going to be floating down 75th Street. I sure didn't want that to happen, because after Grandma finished cooking, we were all going inside to eat, and all those happy people sounds would make my food taste extra, extra good. See, there we go, William and Mr. Dennis. Yeah, that was back in the good old days. But now, somebody else has Grandma's restaurant. It's not named Mama's Kitchen, and I don't go there anymore. Everything is different now that Grandma's sick. 
And even though I know it wasn't really that fly that did it, when I want to be mad about it and there's nobody to be mad at, I get mad at that fly. And then I feel better. Because that pesky old fly again. It's ruining my day. I want my grandma to feel better too. So every day I try to think of a whole lot of things to make her laugh. And then I call her up. One day, when she answered the phone, I talked to my local. I said, Hello, this is William's dad. Grandma said, This ain't William. I said, No, but hold on a minute and I'll go get William for you. Then I talked to my real voice. I said, That was me, Grandma. I was just fooling. She said I really fooled her. It made her laugh. She sounded a little bit like she used to. But yesterday, when Mommy and Daddy took me to her house, her face looked real tired. So I kissed it softly and I hugged her, but not too tight. And I sat down beside her and we talked for a long time. I want you to be all the way well again. Grandma said that when she starts feeling better and the doctor says she can go out for a little while, she's gonna come to my house and help me plant my garden. When I close my eyes, I can see just how it's gonna be. See, William and Grandma have a nice hug. It'll be spring. The sun's going to be shining just right, not too hot, so Grandma can feel the pretty day on her arms. And I'm going to help Daddy bring our big, soft chair outside and put it beside the porch for her to sit in. And even though she can't see, she'll tell me just what to do. I'll say, Grandma, I have red flowers and blue flowers and yellow flowers and purple flowers. And she'll say, William, you know, I think the yellow would look real nice next to the red. And I think you want to put the blue next to the purple. And I'll plant everything just the way she tells me to. Here goes grandma with them pretty, pretty flowers. Then we'll go inside the house and a whole crowd of people will be there to surprise her. All the people who used to come to a restaurant and all the people who call her mama, and she'll hug every single one, the big people and the children too. And when I see that, I see my grandma hugging people and making them happy, I'm gonna forget all about that fly. Because then I'll know that some good new days are coming. See everybody showing grandma some love? Yeah, for grandma and... All right, well that was William and the good old days. I hope you liked it, but I sure do. Thank you, William. Uh, now this year, not all of us have been able to spend as much time as we'd want with our loved ones, and this has been for a couple of years. So let's take a bit of time to think about them now and feel free to write your favorite memory of your grandparents or what you like to do with your loved ones when you spend time with them in the chat. And thank you again to Mathia and William for reading. All right, so now it's time to keep talking a bit about black history. Where do you learn about black history? from school, from your parents, from your grandparents, from watching movies. Let's take a look at where most people learn. All right, pretty cool that most people get to know a bit about Black history from just learning right at home. So it's time for another story. And this one is related to a period of American history called the Great Migration. This was from 1916 to 1970, when about 6 million African Americans moved from the South to cities on the East Coast and on the West Coast. This was to escape racism and poverty at home and to pursue better opportunities. So here is a story called This is the Rope by Jacqueline Woodson about how one family made their journey during this time.
Okay, we're going to start that story again in just a second. Um, maybe you can type in the chat if you were able to hear it, but we weren't really able to hear it over here. In the meantime, I see that um, Ernestine um, loved storytelling with her family when her family is together. Any other memories about how you celebrate Black history with your family? All right, so everyone, thank you for bearing with us on that. Um, it's an excellent video, so I would love to just let you know that you can find it on Canopy, and that's Canopy, K-A-N-O-P-Y. If your library has it, you can access it for free. It's called This is the Rope, and it's a story about how one girl and her family moved during the Great Migration. It follows a few generations of her family, and you know what's interesting? They find very uh, many ways to remember their time in the South and commemorate their move um, in their case to New York. So I hope everyone can check out that um, video. Um, the video is by Weston Woods on canopy.com and you can access it through your library. So let's go to the next story. Um, and before we do that, I just wanna share something about the great migration with you. So we'll share that and then go to the next story. All right, and I'm also happy to share with you some other stories um, about the Great Migration as well. All right, so now it's time for one more story. This one is called Harold and the Purple Crayon. Um, and in this story, we have one little boy with a big imagination and a talent for drawing. I'm going to be reading this with my nephew. Harold and the Purple Crayon by Crockett Johnson. One evening, after thinking it over for some time, Harold decided to go for a walk in the moonlight. 
there wasn't any moon, and Harold needed a moon for a walk in the moonlight. And he needed something to walk on. He made a long straight path so he wouldn't get lost. And he set off on his walk, go taking his big purple crayon with him. But he didn't seem to be getting anywhere on the long straight path. So he left the path for a shortcut across a field, and the moon went with him. The shortcut led right to where Harold thought a forest ought to be. He didn't want to get lost in the woods, so he made a very small forest with just one tree in it. It turned out to be an apple tree. The apples would be very tasty, Harold thought, when they got red. So he put a frightening dragon under the tree to guard the apples. It was a terribly frightening dragon. It even frightened Harold. He backed away. His hand holding the purple crayon shook. Suddenly he realized what was happening, but by then Harold was over his head in an ocean. He came up thinking fast, and in no time he was climbing aboard a trim little boat. He quickly set sail, and the moon sailed along with him. After he had sailed long enough, Harold made land without much trouble. He stepped ashore on the beach, wondering where he was. The sandy beach reminded Harold of picnics, and the thought of picnics made him hungry. So he laid out a nice, simple picnic lunch. There was nothing but pie. And there were all nine kinds of pie that Harold liked best. When Harold finished his picnic, there was quite a lot left. He hated to see so much delicious pie go to waste. So Harold left a very hungry moose and a deserving porcupine to finish it up. And off he went, looking for a hill to climb to see where he was. Harold knew that the higher up he went, the farther he could see, so he decided to make the hill into a mountain. If he went high enough, he thought, he could see the window of his bedroom. He was tired, and he felt he ought to be getting to bed. He hoped he could see his bedroom window from the top of the mountain. As he looked down over the other side, he slipped, and there wasn't any other side of the mountain. He was falling in thin air. But luckily, he kept his wits and his purple crayon. He made a balloon and he grabbed onto it. And he made a basket under the balloon big enough to stand in. He had a fine view from the balloon, but he couldn't see his window. He couldn't even see a house. So he made a house with windows. And he landed the balloon on the grass in the front yard. He made some more windows. He made a big building full of windows, but none of the windows was his window. He couldn't think where it might be. He decided to ask a policeman. The policeman pointed the way Harold was going anyway, but Harold thanked him, and he walked along with the moon, wishing he was in his room and in bed. Then suddenly, Harold remembered. He remembered where his bedroom window was, when there was a moon. It was always right around the moon. And then Harold made his bed. He got in it, and he drew up the covers. The purple crayon dropped on the floor, and Harold dropped off to sleep. All right, what a lot of fun Harold had with his purple crayon. So now we have some time to talk about a Black British artist named Donald Rodney. Do you have a favorite Black artist? And what medium do they use? Purple crayon, photography, pencil? Donald Rodney was known for using many different media, including photography and pencil. So let's learn a little bit more about him. <laughs>
All right, thank you everyone. Donald Rodney was known again for using different media and um, in that famous photograph, um, he's holding a house that is symbolic of both race and also his experience with illness as um, he was experiencing sickle cell anemia. Let's take a look in the chat. Um, I see that Vanessa remembers playing Montgomery bus boycott with her little sister when they were kids. They both would pretend to be Rosa Parks. What a way to honor Rosa Parks. I bet she would be so honored. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, who are some other heroes that we have out there? Um, Tatiana mentioned Gordon Parks photography. Excellent. Yes, definitely. I love Gordon Parks too. Um, and we have a shout out to Jeremiah Gilliam, um, a wonderful painter. Uh, we've had several events with him and been able to see um, beautiful artwork. There's actually a piece that I have near me that I can show you. All right, so thank you everyone for participating in the chat. Uh, for those of you who would like to try a drawing activity that is similar to the Donald Reynolds activity, uh, Donald Rodney activity, excuse me, all you have to do is get a piece of paper, something to write with, and something to draw. So it could even be your hand or a leaf. And uh, for example, I drew my hand and with a Sharpie and I did not lift my fingers or my hand from the paper. I just kept drawing a continuous line, uh, line drawing like the one that we saw um, from Donald Rodney. So I hope that you have fun trying that at home like I did. And everyone, I want to thank you again for coming to our Black History Month um, celebration. And before we go, I just want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank Mathia and William for being our readers. I want to thank our video editor, Amy. And I want to thank um, all of those who, of you who are behind the scenes, Tawana, Vanessa, um, Everyone, you can rewatch this and other videos on our YouTube channel. I definitely recommend that you check out the video that we were going to show you on Canopy. And please look out for other events at our website, wegff.org. We're going to be celebrating Read Across America on March 2nd. Um, and you can check out nea.org to find out more about that. So happy Black History Month, everyone. Uh, bye now. <laughs>